Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm, I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of the bookstore, uh, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And uh, we're uh, quite delighted to uh, have uh, with us this evening Michael Foyer, uh, who's here to talk about his new book, uh, Can Schools Save Democracy? Civic Education and the Common Good. Uh, Michael's been a, a, a leading voice uh, for years in our national debate about how to educate young people and also uh, how to train the teachers uh, who teach them. Uh, at George Washington University, where he arrived uh, 13 years ago, he serves as dean of the Graduate School of uh, Education and Human Development uh, and a professor of uh, education policy. Uh, before that, uh, he spent uh, about a decade and a half uh, in leadership positions at the National Ac Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Uh, where he was instrumental in shaping a prominent role in education for the National Academies. Uh, he's also worked as a senior analyst at um, the Congressional Office of Technology Assessment. He's held uh, faculty posts at Drexel and Georgetown Universities. And he's been uh, president of the National Academy of Education. Uh, in addition to the many edited uh, volumes and, and journal uh, articles that uh, he's written, uh, Michael's uh, the, uh, author of a book on philanthropy and public policy and another another book on relations between education, research, policy, and practice. His latest book uh, certainly has a provocative title, Can Schools Save Democracy? which uh, recognizes uh, that our democracy is in trouble and that schools do have a role in saving it. A part of the remedy, he argues, lies in reviving civics instruction and imbuing it with concepts and, and principles about the common good. Another part would involve revising how teachers are prepared. But, um, but Michael stresses that, that improvements in schools and teachers alone won't be enough. He makes clear that public education means not just what happens in our schools, but also how schools partner with their communities, with business, government, media, uh, and the arts, and how, uh, in other ways, the general public uh, can be brought to understand better the functioning of democracy, uh, its frailties, uh, and the inherent tensions between individual rights and social outcomes. Here to talk with Michael about all this is Valerie Strauss, a veteran education reporter at the Washington Post, where she writes the long-running Answer Sheet blog. Now, Valerie has known many education deans uh, in her time on the beat and uh, says uh, Michael is her favorite. <laughs> so um, please join me in welcoming Michael Foyer and Valerie Strauss. Thank you, Brad. Thank you all for being here. Um, I would first like to start out by telling you that Michael starts his book out with a delightful little bit of a little riddle from Jewish folklore, which uh, asks, uh, who's right, pessimists or optimists? And the, as he says, the mischievous answer is that pessimists are armed with more data. <laughs> Presumably better data, too. The thing about Michael that's so uh, marvelous is that he, he marries the two of them. He, he has all the great data, but he also has an outlook of optimism, which is pleasant in, in, in these times. So let's start, Michael. Tell us why this book, why now? Well, first of all, thank you, um, everybody, for being here. This is a real treat. I thank you, Valerie. Uh, I, I want to say before we get into the into the book uh, that it's a real pleasure to be at my local bookstore. Um, I've been coming here since about 1990, 
when um, my then young son and I actually schlepped boxes from the other side of Connecticut Avenue uh, in an event that the Washington Post uh, later referred to as the literary equivalent of a barn raising. And I didn't think of it until today, actually, that that would have actually been an example for me to use in my challenge to a fairly prominent author that many of you may have read um, already named Robert Putnam. Um, because yes, maybe we are bowling alone, uh, but as he put it, but apparently we're moving books together. And I remember this experience as one of the high points of living in this area. And I just want to say, um, I'll get back to this example in a moment, but I want to say thank you to Politics and Prose for having me, and special thanks to Valerie uh, for doing this. Her, her friendship is surpassed only by her commitment to the promise of American education and the power of good journalism. So talk about a neighborhood treasure. Um, and by the way, I'm grateful to the rest of you who <laughs> took time from the grim news around the world uh, to come here about something less daunting, how to save democracy. <laughs> uh, and what better day to do it than election day? So anyway, I'm an academic. I'll try to avoid the jargon anyway. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the bit about optimism, Valerie. And the book schlepping story is actually relevant in a way. Um, I have no doubt that social capital in America has been damaged severely by polarization and by a nasty tribalism. Uh, if you're not sure what I mean, go to a local school board meeting in Florida. You'll get a, you'll get a taste of it. On the other hand, I also have evidence of a kind of communal caring of different kinds of social capital that are really important to the healthy functioning of this democracy. Um, as I write in the book, and I'm not going to read excerpts except for occasional little quote here or there, uh, as the dean of an education school in a university that was smacked uh, by the pandemic with its worst financial crisis in 200 years, I have data of community cohesion and a kind of ferocious determination to keep the wheels on the bus. Uh, lots of people I worked with seem to follow Lester Holt's nightly advice, take care of yourself and each other. And it's the same I found for faculty and school teachers who moved their lessons from classrooms to computers, to parents and neighbors who organized support groups, to nurses and doctors who risked their lives for others. The fact that Zoom made it into the Oxford English Dictionary's list of words of the year says something. And of course, during the pandemic, God knows we had to bowl alone. And in fact, we had to breathe alone. But we kept in touch virtually, and I would say virtuously. However, lest you think that I am hopelessly and congenitally cheerful. I was starting to wonder. Yeah, I know. I will use an expression that is familiar to the education policy wonks here. The nation is at risk. The threat posed by what Ann Applebaum has called the lure of authoritarianism really can't be overstated. The Social Science Research Council reported that the US is one of several countries to have experienced what is called backsliding, a sustained and deliberate process of subversion of basic democratic tenets by political actors and governments. I have two words for that, oi vey. Seriously, though, 
If I were a political conservative, which I'm not, at least in the common meaning of that term, I would be furious that a principled ideology has been hijacked by a gang of demagogues and their enablers lying their way to a radically anti-democratic system of autocratic control. When Ruth Marcus says it's time to start worrying in anticipation of November 2024, we really need to listen. So, even with my optimistic spin on social capital, and even with evidence that the guardrails of democracy were holding, are holding, uh, there's no denying that the pessimistic data tells us about the fragile state of democracy. What motivates me in this book, however, is a menace from the other direction. It is the resurgent fundamentalism about free choice, the miracle of markets, the risk of government overreach. If the risk of autocracy is about too much government, orthodox belief in rational self-interest that lifts all boats poses a different challenge. What happens when we let unregulated private choice wreak havoc on the social good. So I'm sorry folks, I don't have a solution to the autocracy problem, although I, I hope at a minimum we don't get complacent until it's too late. But the good news, a rational optimism alert, is that I think we will get back to our senses and that we can prepare future leaders to deal rationally with the complications of democracy. Let me, can I, Go ahead. Can I throw a question Interrupt. In here? I'm interrupting. <clears throat> we don't go uh, a day practically without hearing somebody say the democracy is failing and let's blame the public schools. Ah. And we don't teach civics, we don't teach anything that the kids need, um, and so I want you to talk about that. Is it, is it the public school's fault? Are we, uh, what happened to physics? Uh, to physics, mm. what happened to civics? Um, what is civics? So first of all, that's a great question, and I, I wanna say that I am uh, myself allergic to the, the almost, persistent, predictable attack on schools as being responsible for all our problems. On the other hand, I recognize where that comes from. It, it comes from the sense that we care so deeply about education and our schools that when things go wrong, we figure, well, they must be somehow responsible. And in fact, I think we have allowed uh, for a kind of displacement of some of what is um, important in civics in order to make room for science, mathematics, and I suppose the subjects that most people believe are more likely to be related to people getting good jobs. There's a long tradition in American education history of swings between schools having a political, social, civic responsibility, and schools having a responsibility to prepare people for work. And for the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years, the pendulum had swung in the direction of better math, better science, reading has always been there, but better math and science, largely so that we could compete better with, uh, other economies around the world. But didn't even science take a back seat when um, George W. Bush passed No Child Left Behind and President Obama pa uh, got his grant race to the top proposal out and all they did was care about the test scores of math and reading? Did that affect how much civics was taught? I believe so. I think to some extent we have uh, displaced 
the civics function of public education, not fully, but sufficiently, to make room for more uh, pressure on math, more pressure even on science, certainly more pressure on quote unquote uh, the basics that are associated with people getting uh, out of school and good jobs. You know, when people think about civics, you sort of think about how a bill becomes a law. You think about dates, but that isn't civics education. I mean, that's a very narrow piece of it, and it's good for students to know these basic things. I also, I also believe that there isn't an American who goes through a school who doesn't learn these things. I think that the way we retain information, you forget, and so everybody looks like an idiot when people um, ask them specific questions about the government. But what, what is civics education? What should good civics education look like? What are the dispositions that young people need today that schools can actually help them foster that will allow them to be active citizens in this democracy? Well, I think part of the answer is that education has always had a kind of process orientation and a product orientation. Within public education in the United States, there has always been a sense that the idea was to orient young people toward participation in the democracy without necessarily specifying exactly what skills, what knowledge, what facts they would have to learn. And it is true that if you look at some of the respectable national data that attempts to assess the degree of knowledge among young people about things that we would think fall under civics, government process, history, uh, geography, uh, we've got a lot of, we, there, there are a lot of, <laughs> there, there's a lot of progress waiting to happen there. Um, but I think the, 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 the main answer to your question is um, we, we don't have, we never have had a really coherent definition of exactly what we mean, even by something like civics. It has been diffused in geography, American history. You mentioned how a bill becomes a law. When I was in high school, we had this wonderful course called Problems of Democracy. Um, there wasn't really a curriculum called civics. It was all over the place. The bad news is that because of events in the United States over the last seven or eight years in particular, about that, there is a revival of interest and anxiety about whether we are doing enough in terms of civics. And the good news is that a lot of organizations and a lot of schools are picking up on that and trying to shift the balance back in the direction of preparing young people uh, for really functioning and participating in the democracy. How do, but how, how do you do that? Yeah. How do I do that? How, do you, how, how if you were czar and you could yeah. tell schools what to do, how, what, what should they do? I mean, there yeah. is... Um, well, I left the word czar off my title in the book. Okay. Um, <laughs> but if I were czar, one of the things I would do is try to infuse in the way we are teaching the social studies, and for that matter, even the way we're teaching science and math, some of the principles of, of I guess, what I call here um, understanding of what it means to live in a pluralistic system, understanding the very fundamental tensions between values that we cherish so strongly, individual rights um, and the effects that has on the social, social outcomes. I can give you some examples of that, but I'll wait until you, you give ask Give me some me. examples of that. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, w look, I, the, 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 main, the main point, one of the main points in the book is to uh, try to infuse in high school classrooms principles of collective action. Now, that may sound a little kind of jargony, but I was watching what was happening during the pandemic, and it suddenly occurred to me that there may be an entire generation of elected officials and others who were absent on the day that we, that we taught anything about how unregulated free choice leads to real social problems. I would present this in a classroom by asking young people, I'll ask these, this young, these young people, what is it when you're driving on the northbound lane of the highway and suddenly traffic creeps to a halt and then you realize that there was no obstruction in the northbound lane, but that what happened was on the southbound lane there was either an accident or a movie star walking around and people in the northbound lane started to slow down to have a look. I know that sounds like sort of silly or trivial. Turns out it's a real metaphor for what happens when people, good people, make rational decisions that accumulate into a social mess. The first person who comes upon the accident on the, out on the southbound side does the following calculation, and I wish I could take credit for this, but this is actually a story told by a, a great Nobel laureate in economics, Tom Schelling. That first driver figures, I'm going to slow down for a minute, doesn't affect me in any significant way. The cost of that delay is worth it to me for the sake of seeing what's going on totally rational calculation. <clears throat> but you can see where this is going because the poor guy or driver behind that first driver has no choice but to slow down. And now as this accumulates, the 200th driver is thinking, what the heck is going on here? I would not have bargained to lose a half an hour on my way to work for the sake of a half a minute to see what's going on. And yet, that was the inevitable outcome. By which time, by the way, that driver says, of course, now that I've already paid, I might as well slow down and have a look too. So it is this logic of, of rational individual choice that leads to what we know as rubbernecking. Philadelphia, they used to call it gaper block, for which there is really no technological solution. In fact, there isn't really an, a social solution either. I'm digressing. The point being here, these are the kinds of things that I would love to see introduced into teacher education and then indirectly into classrooms so that more of our young people control outcomes. So Other examples are possible. You know, you were talking about the rational among us. And then you have states that are passing laws that don't let teachers tell the truth about history, about racism, about gender. And um, there's, a, there's a, a good number of states that do this now. And so how do, you, how do you square those restrictions with the idea that kids need to learn the truth? Now, one of the truths that some civics education experts say is imperative to be taught is that in any expansion of civil rights in this country, there's, it's only happened through advocacy, through collective action, which is what you mentioned. 
but you have leaders of certain states who think collective action means socialism. That's where we are today. That's, that's one of the challenges for civics education, for, for, for comprehensive civic education. Is there an answer? Is there an answer? What, what can people, what, what's the answer for America when kids can't learn the truth? <laughs> uh, right. I, <laughs> I think what you're getting at, Valerie, is, is a very significant feature of, of the way education has been visualized and organized especially in the United States. It fundamentally, these big questions of what to teach, what is valued, and, and how to square political or ideological preferences with what goes on in classrooms has always been a point of contention. And like it or not, my sense of this is that we could be making at least some progress by having more teachers willing and able to equip their students with the analytical skills so that they can, at least in their own ways, untangle some of these conflicts rather than necessarily uh, impose particular points of view in those classrooms. And the trade-off here is that as, as you see and as we see, there are places where they are banning books and taking things out of the curriculum and badgering teachers who dare to present certain kinds of material because they feel that that is somehow an encroachment on their, um, on their rights to keep a distance between values that may be expressed by the schools, the teachers, the system, and their own uh, very uh, strongly held personal preferences. So I don't have an answer to, to that problem, but I do think I could make the case for teachers becoming better, more skilled at creating an environment in classrooms that where young people can actually understand the tensions without necessarily telling them which way to come out on any of these big, in any of these big fights and um, you know so uh, yeah. so are you saying that that teacher preparation is as much or or is a is, is a problem I'm not going to say as much as states dictating mm -hmm. what teachers can say and not say but that teacher training is insufficient and in preparing teachers to allow kids to help kids develop analytical skills, risk assessment skills, those kinds of things it takes to to, to live as an active citizen. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't want to try to make any kind of blanket judgment about the quality of teacher education. Obviously, we could be doing things better and differently. We do know more about ways in which teachers can present material that uh, kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, stimulates, provokes creative thinking. Um, so you're saying school is too often boring? Well, not the school I went to. Oh. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not that it's boring. It's that um, it's, it's a big challenge for teachers to work in classrooms where they know that the kids are coming in, especially at the high school level, but maybe even earlier, with uh, a lot of a, a lot of a lot of baggage. 
you know, they say in real estate, the, uh, the three rules of real estate are location, location, location. Looking at some of my real estate buddies here. In, in education, it's the three R's are relevance, relevance, relevance. And if there were ways for teachers to engage with their students on issues that the students are dealing with, struggling with, hearing about at home, but not in a way that um, gives them the false sense of their always being easily right and wrong answers, but rather to understand more about the history, the, the, the kind of the, 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 the reasons why these are complicated issues. That's where I think you have some really interesting things going on in, in classrooms uh, in many schools today. Um, I'm not sure I'm actually no, no, getting that. Another question. Yeah. Researchers say, as you know, that. Well, then it must, uh, then it it must, must be, be true. true. Right. right, must be true. Um, researchers say that what happens in school affect that kids are affected mostly, let's say, by by like two thirds of it of, of what affects them comes from outside school. Mm -hmm. So the I so maybe you have a third that schools can affect how kids think, behave. So how much so going back to the title of of, of your book how much can schools really be expected to do when kids are affected by parents, by churches, by social media, by their friends, by their enemies, by all kinds of things outside? Mm -hmm. And um, then, and then, as 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 we noted before, schools get blamed for the for all of the things that they really can't affect. How much can they affect these kinds of things you're talking about? Look, it depends exactly how you, how you want to. I, I can answer that in two ways. If you look at the data on achievement measured by test scores, for example, there's pretty compelling evidence that much of the variance in achievement scores is explained by variables that are not in schools home background issues, poverty, the social environment, et cetera. One could then reach what I think is the wrong inference from that and say, well, then what's the point of investing in schools since so much of the action is actually outside? And I think fundamentally that would be a huge mistake because even though we have a lot of what goes on in education explained by things that are out of the control of the school per se. We have a lot of evidence of how much progress can be made for kids in schools that are functioning well, that have the right materials, that have the good qualified teachers in spite of the difficulties that children come to school with. So that's part of the answer. The other part of the answer is I still think that, you know, when I think back to that Problems of Democracy course, um, when I was doing it, it was 19, late 1960s, that's antiquity, but the main, the main topic of conversation was the protests outside for civil rights, the protests outside for the war in Vietnam. And the good teachers had figured out how to engage the students on issues that were relevant to them because of what was going on outside and use that as a way to actually stimulate more learning about the subjects, history, economics, geography, Sociology, even though we didn't call it that, et cetera. Um, so I think there's, there, there's ways in which we can be doing this 
better, and there are places that are doing it quite well. Um, there are. What do you think of the idea of, instead of just sort of telling students <coughs> what we want them to know, giving them a role in running the school? Giving, allowing them to be part of decision making so that they have to come to understand the kinds of compromises you have to make in a democracy where you give and take. That has been done, there's, I know there was, uh, there's, a, there's an organization in Britain actually, so the democracy schools, and that they've had some, there was, there's been a collection of democracy schools in this country over, over at, at some point, small groups. What do you, th what, what do you think of that? I, I don't really know what I think of that. I, I, look, I do think that, as I said earlier, one of the, one of the functions of, of schools is defined more in terms of process than in terms of product. I would love to see more classrooms w which promote a kind of spirit of decision making, of inquiry, of kind of, um, shall we say, unpacking, discovery, as opposed to more more pressure to learn skills that show up on the on the test at the end of the year um, and I think there's a lot of uh, a, a lot of enthusiasm for that in the education policy and in the education research community to create environments where young people actually have a chance and are encouraged to ask interesting tough questions and become a little bit more confident that they will be able to at least say to themselves, huh, I think I, think I understand more about this than I, than I did before we started this. But I have to say that you have a lot of uh, communities in the United States where the idea of allowing those kinds of decisions to be left into the hands and minds of the young people, of the kids, is viewed as uh, a complete abdication of uh, what schools are supposed to be about, which is get the kids, you know, sit them down and get them reading, writing, and prepared right. for the next thing. Right. All right. <clears throat> questions. Um, there is a mic here, so whoever wants to ask questions should come line up, and we will start taking them. Matt. I know the first question is going to be, what happened to the rest of my speech? <laughs> I spared you that. So um, I'm older than you. I was in college during Vietnam. Uh, yeah, me at, too. <laughs> we moved. I don't hold that against you, by the way. Well, um, we moved from the, I'm from Massachusetts. We moved from the gritty little mill town where the family business was and remained. Uh, 26 miles east uh, to Newton, Massachusetts, where the schools were very good. And I had a marvelous education, uh, you know, uh, kindergarten through. But times have changed. And do you talk in your book about the tremendous backlash against government? When we grew up, government was good. Now government is bad. Private is always better. Um, and the problem with Schools are teachers and teacher unions, and they are attacked relentlessly. Um, and they're now having trouble filling slots for teachers in public school. And there's lots of homeschooling and charter schools. Um, do you talk about that? Actually, thank you, yeah. I mean, one of the main themes in the book mm -hmm. is that this overzealous what I call fundamentalist belief in the private sector right. is a very big hazard for democracy, number one. Number two, I think that if we were to equip young people with a little bit more skill, knowledge, and evidence about the difficulty of striking the right balance between the virtues of private markets and the dangers in terms of the social good, maybe we would have leaders who would give us a somewhat more interesting discourse about public policy. The other thing I can tell you is people in my profession are quite aware of the, shall we say, um, the, the persistent 
badgering of things even like the teachers union as if that's the cause of a lot of our problems. Now I, I have certain misgivings about what some of the teachers unions have done over the years, but when you look at the evidence, the fact that Massachusetts has not only one of the most highly unionized and successful unionized teaching cores in the United States, and by the way, also has the highest test scores, it does create a certain amount of uh, resistance to this argument that all you got to do is shut down the unions, turn everything over to charter schools and vouchers, and that will solve our problems. It's not just Massachusetts. It's <coughs> no, no, New Jersey. Other places all too, of the sure. heavily, heavily right. unionized Maryland. teachers uh, have, have higher test scores for, for, for different reasons. Can you talk a little bit about why you think the choice movement is essentially anti-democratic? I don't think it's essentially anti-democratic. I don't, I don't think that the choice movement in public education is anti-democratic. I think in the case of the United States, it is an example of something which I actually appreciate, which is a certain amount of, shall we say, uh, not, let's not be too sure that we've got exactly the right approach to how to organize even something like education. There may be things that even in our best public school systems, we haven't yet figured out. And if we can allow communities and others to have the resources to try some innovations, to try some things that are outside of the mainstream, that might be good for all of us. Again, it's a matter of balance. I'm very worried about the complete dismantling of public education. I was, I'm a public school, leaving aside the fact that I'm a public school kid, that my kids were public school kids, and that I think that public education is in, sa in fact what, what may save this country. At the same time, I like the idea that we are allowing some other ideas to bloom uh, outside of the, uh, of the confines of a, of a public bureaucratic system. So, <clears throat> I know you wanted me to say that I hate no, charter I schools. No, I thought you were. I thought that's what you were saying before. No, that I'm, that that you were that you, that that was part of, of what, what the assault of pub, on public education was. Public public funding for Catholic schools, public funding for voucher schools. I thought that's part of the choice movement. That's why I yeah, phrased no, well, that question that way. Public funding for for religious schools is that's a whole different. Com complication. That's part of the choice movement. That's part of the choice movement. But you know, we've had that, we've had that, um, not public funding of religious schools, but we've always had religious schools in the United States. And over the decades, they've never gotten more than 10 or 11% of the total action. Right, but we you have know charter that's, schools yes. that get maybe 4% of the total action. So there's a lot of seven. a lot of concern. Is it up to seven? It's up to seven. Well, I think, I'd, but it also varies by location. But I think um, I'm not that worried about that as much as I am by the idea that um, either that the system will be completely overtaken by this fantasy that privatizing things is the answer. But that's not just in education. That's in a lot of things, you know. Right. No, no, that, yeah. that, that's so. right. But that's why I asked the question, because of privatization, yeah. Yeah. Okay, sir. Uh, my name's Hugh Allen, and uh, I know Michael from the public schools and his kids. Wow. We're friends. Michael, in terms of your book, I think you said earlier that uh, in terms of civic education, you would suggest starting at high school and going forward. Mm -hmm. My question would be, why not come down a little bit lower and some of the lower grades, maybe junior high or a little bit lower, and they have goals that are linked to where the high schoolers are going and they're adding to that discussion and conversation. That's one question. Uh, the other question is, what do you think of the uh, Teach for America crowd and maybe where it is and so forth? And here's the reason I'm asking that. That's a, that was brought in as a way to energize and kind of be innovative in teaching. 
the challenge with local schools are most of those kids that come in stay for three to five years and they move on and they deplete the resource available. And in terms of, uh, this is going to be a statement I think, in terms of runaway choice, I thought one of the more historical examples was, as I understand history, allegedly, that James Madison was the one that set up the Electoral College and none of us in this room have the ability to vote directly for the president. So there's a perfect way to put up a barrier to keep runaway choice from getting out of hand and electing demagogues. Okay, that's it. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, you, I'm so nice, it's so nice to see you. And, and second of all, I'm flattered that you think I know anything enough about the Electoral College <laughs> to even try that one. But I will try the other two no, questions. No. The first question was, why, why focus on high school as a place to start? And, uh, you know, among friends, I'll tell you, I had to start somewhere. <laughs> uh, and um, I, I did have friends who read early drafts and said, you know, you really ought to think about pushing this down to the earlier grades. And, and I thought, uh, yeah, I'm having enough trouble untangling my argument about <laughs> even starting in high school. Um, but it's, it's a totally legitimate question. I think, as a matter of fact, there would be ways to introduce, even in the elementary grades, modules, classroom experiences, where kids really get a chance to feel and learn about some of these conflicts between their rights as individuals and their little communities. So I'd love to experiment with, look, I, first of all, I'm not a curriculum designer, so uh, this is suggestions for the other people to do it right, uh, but I'd love to see it at, at that level. So thank you for that question. As far as Teach for America, uh, look, my only real problem with Teach for America is that um, it, on the one, the, let's put it this way. The interesting potential benefit side of Teach for America is that it attracts a group of really passionate, uh, education-oriented folks who really want to make a difference and get into those schools and see if they can work with these kids and, and do some good. And I love the idea of attracting more young people into the teaching profession, which, by the way, is a big problem we're having right now. The downside is that it continues to sort of perpetuate this idea that good teaching is something you can learn how to do in six weeks of a summer boot camp. And the truth of the matter is that good teaching is actually harder cognitively and otherwise than nuclear physics. If anybody here thinks it's, ah, you know, it's easy, take a classroom of, you know, 30 third graders, teach them how to divide fractions. Ah, come on, what's the problem? I'm telling you, I had a Nobel Prize winning scientist tell me once, he got interested in elementary education and he spent a couple of years doing it, and then he decided to go back to something easier, <laughs> looking at the origins of the universe. <laughs> so the short and long of it is, again, this is a, a, a matter of balance. Teach for America brought a lot of young people into the profession. Yes, there was an attrition rate, there was a... It was pretty high. It, yeah. It was pretty high. Right now, the attrition rate, even among people who've gone through more traditional, uh, we, uh, I, these are my these are my people. You know, we're pre we're preparing a lot of teachers, and I don't know how long they're going to stay in the profession either. So it, the short answer is, like most of what I've been thinking and writing about for a long time, it's a, you got to find a little bit of the in between. Quick follow-up, so should, yep. should we reset and what? form a different organization of teachers? Let's, uh, oh. let's, let's, let's move on. Thank you. Oh, Thank good. You. <laughs> Ma <Ma Ma. laughs> okay. My, my name is Joy Hakem, and um, I know I, you. You know me. <laughs> okay. Joy my Hakem <laughs> has written some of the most brilliant textbooks 
in history and science. Oh. Well, well, thank you. Ever. It's, she is uh, brilliant. Thank you. That's really nice. Um, and so here we are with, with books, and you guys aren't talking about books. And, and I think in the worst you know, with the worst teacher or the most inexperienced, you know, if kids have good books, they can educate themselves, to certainly to a degree. And the books, the great scandal in, in, our, in our time and actually for decades is textbooks. And um, textbooks make a huge amount of money for, for, a, for a few companies. And, and um, those textbook companies own our schools. And you know we're talking about everything but the textbook. Um, well, that's they, gotta... they own the schools along with the Texas board, uh, the Texas Education. Uh, sorry, Agency. sorry, yeah. I won't buy that. I won't buy that. There is a teacher in Texas who decided, that, well, actually, her her I don't know leader, somebody came to her and, and she's a good teacher, and said, "I'm giving you." the lowest scoring, a class of the lowest scoring boys, this is in Dallas, and, and see what you can do with them. She said to him, I'll take that challenge on one condition, that I can pick whatever book, textbook I you know, want to use. So she, yeah, she picked one of my, my, uh, my books, naturally. <laughs> but, uh, but the way she used it was just incredible. Um, but over, uh, and, and I guess I could tell you about it. <laughs> no, no, I know, but but, but you but, but you know these companies. But listen, but, ha, they, they 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 don't write the textbooks without guidance from from the states about what goes into them. Well, yeah, well I do. do too. I same thing. I have to to, yeah. to do that. But but the um, I mean they, well, they my books were adopted in uh, Oakland, California. Mm -hmm. um, I sort of a, you know was really pr pleased, proud. Um, Within, so I and and I then and actually the school schools paid me for them. I was like six months later. I was in California. I thought oh, I'm gonna go see what's happened to those books, how they're doing. I went into an Oakland school. Teachers and asked about my books. Teachers said, "Oh yeah, I think Joe Smith still uses them." I said, "What? Well, you know, they they paid for them. It was supposed to be six years or something." Uh, Houghton Mifflin had come in, to, and, and Houghton Mifflin is just like their four four companies, the, uh, and and just taken them from classrooms and put their own books. Um, textbook. If if you sell, if I come in here and buy five books, you're going to think she's a pretty good customer. But if you sell books to the uh, Washington schools, I mean, we're talking huge numbers. And so this is big business, and and Ab it's it is absolutely true. It is absolutely true that that textbooks have been an, a couple, an issue. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. a couple of companies that, and I mean, right. I I know the people who write the books. I mean, it's it's one of these scandals that really doesn't get appreciated. Don't right. use commercial textbooks. There, right. I'm not the only one writing good right. good books. So got it. Thank you. Hi there. I'm a democracy advocate married to a teacher, mm -hmm. so you're going to see two different lenses of questions here, and we both obviously are fans um, of, of your work. Um, I wonder if you have insights on what the, the balance is of what the onus for an individual school versus policymakers. Um, and as an educator of educators, you're talking about systems change at a school level, right, and kid to kid and in a classroom. What's the balance we need to be looking at now at either state level advocacy, federal advocacy, and where does that onus lie? Because education is only a great equalizer when there's equal resources to make it that way. Yeah, thanks, Molly. Nice to see you. I, look, I, um, I, I think you're on to a very important realization here. Most parents have the perspective of what goes on in their kids' school. But a lot of what happens in their kids' school is a function of a kind of collective aggregation of ideas that are somehow in the great big sausage maker of democratic decision making converted into curricular standards, guidelines, and all of that, which then come back down to the schools largely through 
somewhat at least through the teacher preparation system so that it's not entirely clear where we could be putting more pressure in order to affect this kind of more enlightened classroom instruction. And, you know, um, I'm not sure if I'm being clear about this, but as it is, teachers are under a huge amount of pressure, in part because we believe in a school system that's supposed to be, supposed to have somewhat porous boundaries with the outside world, relevance, relevance, relevance. And at the same time, we, we are stuck because every attempt to introduce better teaching systems, curricula, materials, books, whatever, is met with a, some form of public I suppose, democratic response. So all of that adds up to saying, if you think about it, it's amazing that we've made as much progress as we've had with all of this chaotic system of who controls uh, what goes on in the schools. And I don't know if I'm even close to answering your question, but it was fun talking about it. <laughs> and we have only a few more minutes, yeah. so yeah. let's get in the rest of the questions. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Dean Foyer. It's great to see you. And as a middle school teacher in the area, I'm really looking forward to not only reading this book, but introducing it to my classrooms. And you're talking a lot about teacher pressure um, and um, the position, you know, needing good teachers to be able to have teachers who can have these types of conversations and facilitate this type of learning. I am currently someone who spent six years in the classroom and is looking for ways to turn my passion in education into a more sustainable career. And I had other questions, but this, this one I feel like is very pertinent. How do we invest resources both short term and long term into creating teachers who and keeping teachers who are really passionate about the work that they do, like me, and want to bring these types of conversations into the classroom? Um, and convince them to build a career on doing that to be able to save democracy. Good. Um, <laughs> hey, I'm back. Um, I think you're right to ask the question about resources. It is not perhaps going to be a surprise to hear that in schools that are better resourced, there are more opportunities for teachers to think about and then actually enact creative classroom experiences. And in other schools that are poorly resourced, there just isn't the flexibility. It's not so much that the teachers aren't as qualified, although we have a big problem there too. They don't necessarily have the right mix of skills and knowledge uh, that are appropriate to the, to the very difficult school environments that they're working in. But overall, look, the idea that, that teachers can go into classrooms feeling both that they have some tools, some skills, some ideas that have been to some extent studied and shown to be likely to have a good effect, that's a, that's a big ask. And um, what can I tell you? You know, when you look at the, um, the, the unfortunate uh, reality of how our teachers are compensated, and on top of that, we pile them on with, you're not doing this good enough, you're not doing that well enough, and by the way, if the scores of your kids don't improve, we're going to put your names in the newspaper. This is all the, the wrong way to promote that kind of thing. We have one more one minute, more and minute. I want him okay. to, to get his sure. chance. Good. Hi. Talk my name fast. Is, yes. My name is Ed Dieterle, and I'm the proud parent of two high schoolers currently at Jackson Reed, which is formerly Wilson High School. Hmm. I attended NAEP Day earlier, and there were a lot of information that was presented about how students across the United States are doing. 
Coupled with that <laughs> was a report released by uh, Learning Heroes that suggests that about 90% of parents across the United States believe that their students are achieving at or above grade level. Mm -hmm. And Michael, I know that you have a deep passion about measurement, mm. and I was wondering your thoughts about how measurement can bring light to this conversation and help us to define the outcomes that are important, allowing us to vary on activity. I'm looking at the, the clock here. I, I mean, it's a great question, Ed, and I do think you're quite right to uh, finger the role of measurement in any of these conversations. In my 40 years of working in this, I have not yet been in a conversation about educational reform or educational progress or innovation without the question coming up, how do you know it's working? Quickly, it comes up usually within the first 10 or 15 minutes. Here it took 48 minutes, and that's because I spoke too long. But you're quite right that um, it would be fascinating to develop an approach to student, and for that matter, teacher assessment that could capture some of these more advanced ideas of what we really want to see taking place in classrooms. And the good news is that there are some of the smartest people in the world and in the country working on exactly those kinds of uh, possibilities, as, and, and you know some of them. Um, and I think uh, in, a, in a country such as ours, which um, is so heavily kind of immersed in the culture of accountability, it's, it's the old problem. You know, uh, are, are my tax dollars being spent wisely? Show me the evidence. And what comes from that is, well, test scores have gone up, or test scores are not going down, depending how you want. We are now at a point when we could be doing a lot more with technologies of measurement that would not only answer some of those questions about how we are doing, but would at the same time promote better teaching and learning in classrooms. So one of the ideas that it's in the you've, book you've got here. You've got 30 seconds. 30 We're, seconds. We, we've already blown Brad, uh, Brad's heart stop at oh, eight. that's all right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if, 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 for example, if you, if you kind of like the idea of introducing in a chemistry class in a high school reasons why climate change is not just a matter of chemistry, but it's a matter of economics, too. If you buy that, which I hope first you have to buy the book, then you have to buy the argument. It's a two-step process. But then the question becomes, can we come up with some ways of evaluating to what extent that's actually working? And I'm all open to continuing that part of the conversation. Thank you, Michael. If you don't have the book, go and buy it, and he will be signing them here. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, Valerie. All for coming. And thank you, Politics and Prose.